utter delight to be here, and I'm not just not just saying that because that's what guest speakers say. Um, I'm saying it for for the reasons that Dave just articulated so well. Um, we love coming to this church, and when I get to bring my wife, it's a special treat because we both enjoy the friendships and the partnership in the gospel that we have here and that's developed over the years to uh, to be with your pastors and and their wives um, you know that's coming annually is the, we, we look forward to this trip um, with great expectation and last night we hung out together and it, it, it did not disappoint it was exciting when at one point Dave had a all the guys go around the table and just tell one thing that they're really encouraged about um, that's going on here in the church. And the the common refrain around the table was, how do I limit it to just one? So it, it, thank you for the way you love your pastors and the way you love this church and the way you're serving, the way you worship so passionately the way you take what you get here and shine in our, our dark world it, it really is an inspiration I, I always I come here and part of me comes here and I'm selfish because I know I'm gonna leave encouraged and I know I'm gonna leave refreshed and I know I'm gonna leave with stories to tell <laughs> unexpectedly last night I heard lots of stories about Dave York's early ministry as an itinerant preacher, if you haven't heard any of those stories, you have to hear those stories. You have to demand that they find their way into sermons at some point. So that was unexpected. What was expected was I'm going home and I'm going to get a lot of mileage out of a Bill Hurd story. <laughs> Remember last time I was here, I told you on Sunday morning about Bill on an airplane next to a guy named George from Hollywood, who he eventually shares the gospel with, gets off the plane, tells his friend about it, said, what was that guy's last name? Oh, George Lucas, I think. So Bill Witness to George Lucas, had no idea who he was. <laughs> Never seen a Star Wars movie. <laughs> so last night, Dave Rubel and I got to hear a story of a wounded elk walking down the street, been in a fight, all messed up, with its eyeball hanging out. <laughs> now, I see an elk walking down the street with its eyeball hanging out. I'm thinking, that's a zombie elk. This is the apocalypse. I'm out of here. Bill thinks, I got to put that eye back in. <laughs> so he says to his friend, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rope him. And of course he's got rope in his back seat because why not? He ropes the elk, who apparently doesn't know that he's about to be helped, and the elk goes kind of crazy. And it ends up that Dave and his, or, uh, Bill and his friend get the elk down on the ground, they pin him, and they realize, we can't move because if we let this elk go, it's going to kill us. So they lay there until help comes. And eventually, a car comes driving down the road. Now imagine being the people in that car. Bill and his friend on top of an elk with its eye hanging out. Well, those folks call the ranger, and the ranger comes, and Bill got to put the eye back in the elk and see it on its way. So I, I'm going to get lots of mileage out of that story. There, there's a part two to that story that you got to go. You got to hear from um, Bill. So, you know, I, I know you guys are in a, in a bittersweet season, having just sent Luis and Amanda away. Se sending leaders out is, it's, it's bitter because we miss them. It's how it should be. It should be sad. And I know that's been a, a, quite a sacrifice for you guys. Those are special people. And uh, it's also sweet because the gospel's advancing and, and Jesus is building his church. And uh, um, you, you guys then get the added sweetness of the Lord providing uh, Dave Quilla and his wife, Pam. And I can tell you, I know these folks, it is icing on the cake. Um, I am absolutely thrilled about this transition, what it means for this church, what it means for this 
region that I, you know, I think eventually there's going to be a northwest region. Not that I'm eager to have that happen because I love this connection, but Dave being here and doing what he does, I think is going to just strengthen this church and our our uh, region of churches. So I'm super excited, and I, I'm feeling it with you. Because I'm uh, just by way of a regional update, we're, we're going to send one of our pastors off staff to plant a church in Des Moines, Iowa. Sean Powers is doing that, and he's been with us about as long as Luis was with you, about five years, and he's a dear friend, and I don't like to think about that day that we're going to be sending him and his wife, Sharice, and their two daughters off, but it's going to be, it's going to be bittersweet. Now, I want you to know this. Dave York is Sean's church planting coach. So how cool is that? So how cool is that? Our churches are as far away as they are, but your church is helping my church plant a church in Des Moines, Iowa, which by the way, you might not know this is the fastest growing city in the Midwest. I mean, who knew? But it is, and uh, they need gospel-centered churches there. And, and Dave, Dave works so hard as the chairman of our church planting committee. So not only is he coaching and we've got that church plant going on, but we're in the process of adopting a church in Bozeman, Montana. So only 12 hours from here, so pretty soon you'll have a next-door neighbor, Sovereign Grace Church. <clears throat> but uh, D- Dave's seen that thing through, and that's on track. And y- your support of this church supports our wider mission together. And so I just want to say thank you on behalf of Sovereign Grace Churches. And w- we have a healthy region I mean, we, we are just in a season of blessing. Every church in the region is growing. We've got churches that have outgrown their facilities like this one, looking for another place to meet. We've got churches that are going to have to go to two services. Our churches are seeing conversions, people transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And I am eager to worship over the word with you now. So will you please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Psalms? If you let your Bible fall open, you'll probably end up there. We're, we're going we're gonna to go to the beginning. Psalm 1. The gateway psalm. I'm going to read it right away and then we'll, we'll pray again for God's help and, and we'll walk through the gateway together. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Well, Lord, like like Dave already prayed, it, it is a precious thing to gather together as your people. Here we are, living stones, making up your temple, and we don't take it for granted. This really is the dearest place on earth, whether the living stones are gathering in Burnsville, Minnesota, or Roseburg, Oregon. And it's the dearest place because we know that when, when we gather as your church, you're with us. You're here. You're present with us in a way. And so when we open your word together, we anticipate that we're going to hear you speak. So will you talk to us now by your Holy Spirit, enable us to give your word our undivided attention, trusting you to address us and reveal yourself to us, that we would see you more clearly and love you more dearly and follow you more nearly. Those are beautiful lyrics, and it's what we, what we want. So use this preaching moment now to that end, we ask, for our good and for the glory of Jesus, and in his name, amen. 
Well, like I said, this is the gateway psalm. And as we walk through the gate into the whole Psalter through this psalm, we are hit between the eyes with a bold, stark, blunt declaration. Psalm 1 just cuts through the clamor of competing voices and competing priorities and brings us right to the core issue of life. So Psalm 1 is like a trumpet blast to um, busy, distracted, restless people like us. And it ought to get our attention. The message is so simple. And it's delivered here with no ambiguity, no nuance, no qualifications. Not that it's cold and unfeeling. It certainly isn't. But it speaks clearly. And it speaks clearly to our postmodern age of whatever works for you, our age of gray. This psalm is definitely black and white in a gray world. Here's the message of this gateway psalm. There are two types of people living two ways of life, leading to two different destinies. That's blood. And what about black and white and red and yellow and Christian and Muslim and Buddhist and gay and straight and... Nope. Two people, two ways, two destinies. The righteous are on the path of righteousness leading to life and the wicked are on the way of wickedness leading to destruction. There is a profound difference between the righteous and... And the wicked. And and the main thing about this difference, according to this psalm, is that the righteous delight in the law of the Lord and the wicked don't. So, really, this gateway into the rest of the Psalter, into the next 149 Psalms, becomes for us a summons. It's an invitation to delight in God's Word and the wonders, and the majesty, and the glory of God that's revealed here. And it becomes for us a warning. Be this person, not that person. Walk this path, not that path. Arrive at this destiny, not that destiny. That being the case, this psalm calls for assessment, self-assessment. Calls for evaluation, self-evaluation. We need to ask ourselves, which person am I? Which path am I on? To which destiny am I headed? Which one? And it doesn't get more simple and straightforward than that. And the very first phrase makes it clear which we should want to be. Blessed is the man. Now that word that gets translated blessed there, I probably don't have to tell you, means happiness. That's the first word in the book of Psalms. So Psalm, the book of Psalms starts where we all want to end, because we all want to be happy. And, and this, this word, it's not the equivalent to being circumstantially chipper and giddy. This word means deep contentedness. It's about being satisfied deep down in the bones. This is a happiness that's embedded in the heart where circumstances can't reach. And this is not, not a happiness that rests on how healthy you are or whether or not your life is going the way you think it should or how the kids are doing or how your salary is doing. There's a different foundation to this happiness. One that ultimately cannot be shaken. And we're going to see what that is. For now, it's enough to note that with all the paths this world offers to happiness, the psalmist has the audacity to say, no. There are not paths, plural, to happiness. There's just one. And it's the way of the righteous. We could translate that opening phrase like this. There's no verb in the Hebrew. Oh, the happiness of the man. 
Oh, the happiness of the man. It's like the psalmist is saying, you got to check this guy out. Look at him. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to check out the righteous man. We're going to look at him. And then we're going to consider the wicked. We'll look at the destinies of each. And then we'll end talking a little bit about our fight for delight. So first, the righteous. Let's ask, what, let's ask, what characterizes the righteous man? Well, what characterizes him here is something he does not do and something he does do. Let me, let me sum that up like this. The righteous man, here's the negative, avoids wicked influence. And the righteous man, here's the positive, adores the Word of God. He avoids and he adores. First, the righteous man avoids wicked influence. Look at verse 1 again. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. First thing I want us to notice is that this is a separated person. Do you see that? It's the man, singular, and the wicked, plural. It's the man, singular, and sinners, plural. It's the man, singular, and scoffers, plural. So you you get a sense that it's this happy man against the mindset of the crowd. It's this happy man against the mindset of the trendsetters. It's this guy against the mindset of the office, against the mindset of the classroom, against the mindset of social media. He set apart. He stands apart. And when necessary, he stands alone. Because he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He has a a bias against everything evil. Everything dishonoring to God. Any way of thinking, any perspective on life, any values, any, any outlook any worldview if it's dishonoring to god he will have no part of it so he doesn't accept the world's advice he's not influenced by the world's take on life he doesn't listen to the talking heads or the media elite the conventional wisdom of the age he's just not moved by it and if we're not careful we will be moved by it that's why we need this psalm We need this psalm to cut through the din because there's so many voices, so many voices, almost every moment of every day telling us what's what, how to do this and how to do that, how to think about this and how to think about that. And we just taking it in, no filter, the counsel of the world. Years ago, early in our marriage, back when I was in seminary, uh, Delane and I sensed that it would be good for our souls to fast from media completely. And we did. And we just quit all forms of media for a while. And it, it wasn't easy. And back in those days, it was hard. And back in those days, I didn't have a smartphone and Facebook and Instagram and all that. But I remember... It was hard. I don't remember for how long we did it, but I do know that we didn't own a TV again for years. Now, I'm not telling you this so that I seem super pious. That was good for us then. I don't regret it, but I own a television now, and I don't regret that. I got my tickets to Black Panther in advance. I tell you this because one thing I remember most clearly about that time is when we started to interact with with media again. When we started to go to the movies and watch the nightly news and listen to whatever music and read the newspaper like we used to way back then. What I remember is that all of a sudden, I was aware that everything had a message. Everything seemed to be giving me counsel. But I was so immersed in it before that fast that I didn't even notice. I was desensitized 
to it. And oh, how we must notice. We cannot just take it all in without evaluating it against the law of the Lord. Because if we walk in the counsel of the wicked, pretty soon we'll stand in the way of sinners. And that's not what a righteous man does. He's not interested in the lifestyle of sinners. He doesn't want to be morally slippery. He won't linger in their paths. He won't engage in the world's activities. He won't do anything dishonoring to God or anything that might draw his heart away from God. And so he will not sit in the seat of scoffers. He will not take his place with the wicked. He won't settle into the world's chair, taking his ease there, comfortable there, belittling righteousness, thinking and living in a way opposed to God. Just see that progression? It moves from what we believe, the counsel, to how we behave in the way of the wicked, to where we belong in the seat of scoffers. First we come under the influence of the world, Then we try out the lifestyle of the wicked, and finally we are confirmed and committed to wickedness. But not the righteous man. He's not only countercultural, but he's aware of his own innate bent towards selfishness and resistance to God. So he's on his guard. The righteous man doesn't see just how close to the edge he can get without falling over. He avoids wicked influence altogether. He's resolute. Now, you might wonder, isn't this inconsistent with everything my pastors say around here? Isn't it inconsistent with everything I say to my church about not retreating behind the thick walls of the Christian fortress? Doesn't this go against the, the vision of the church being a, a kingdom outpost, or like, like Dave said, an outpost of heaven from which we go out into the world as light to build relationships with non-Christians and get to know them and care for them and have them into our homes and display and declare the gospel to them? Does this psalm and this vision of the church fit? Well, yes, they do. This psalm, and this is important, this psalm is not about associating with the wicked. It's about assimilating to wickedness. We're never called to be isolated from the world. Separated from the world, different from the world, yes. But we throw ourselves, don't we, into our community, into our culture, and we live out a visible, uncompromising resolute devotion to Jesus, to the law of the Lord. And that's a dangerous way to live. It's dangerous because some will be hostile to the way of righteousness. This world is full of scoffers. And it's dangerous because it puts us in the world as Christians where we will hear the counsel. We will experience the way. We will be invited to take the seat. That being the case, Jesus prayed for us. Right before he went to the cross, he prayed what's called the high priestly prayer. John 17, verses 15, 16, and 18. Here's what they say. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So in the world, but not in the way of the wicked. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Right? The, the vision of our being an outpost kingdom uh, for the kingdom to the world is Jesus' vision. We're in the world, but not of it. So the challenge is to come out of the world while remaining in it. Now, I skipped a verse, and it's an important one. It's one that leads into our next one, 1717, where Jesus prays, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So how do we ultimately avoid wicked influence while being meaningfully engaged with the world? Well, we get sanctified in and through the word of truth. 
So not only does the righteous man avoid wicked influence, the righteous man adores the Word of God. Verse 2 of our text again. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This is how we maintain our separateness. This is how we remain distinct. This is how we keep our vitality when meaningfully engaged with the world. We adore the Word of God. We, we cannot know true happiness if all we ever do is say no to the world. No, I don't do that. No, I don't do that. Even more integral to true happiness than a no to the world is a yes to the Word. And not just yes, I'll do that, it's my duty, but adoration, delight in the Word. Delighted devotion, we might say, not perfunctory duty. The law of the Lord captivates and animates the righteous man. Now, that phrase, law of the Lord... In that phrase, the word translated law comes from the Hebrew word for teach. You're familiar with it, Torah. But it's a very broad term. It doesn't merely refer to legislation. So this isn't limited to God's commandments. It refers to all of God's revelation. Everything in here, all his teaching, all his instruction to mankind. So Jesus referred to the Psalms as the law in John 15.25. Paul called the prophets the law, 1 Corinthians 14, 21. But that said, by calling it the law, something is being said about the authority of this word. It is the word of the Lord. It is the law of the Lord. And because it is, because it's His, it has authority over us. And we don't like that by nature, do we? We don't like it. It grates against our sinful nature that loves autonomy and self-sufficiency and self-reliance and self-rule and selfishness. But we are never over this word judging it. I'll take that part about loving your neighbor and doing good stuff for the poor, but man, some of this is so primitive. I mean, I live in the modern world, so I'm just going to skip over all that stuff about marriage and gender roles and homosexuality. We are never over this word. The righteous man places himself under the word, under the law of the Lord. I love how this is expressed in Isaiah 66 too. It says, God says through the prophet, but this is the one to whom I will look. So this is the righteous man that gets God's attention. He was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And it's a trembling under its authority. It's submission to the word that leads to delight. It's submission to the law of the Lord that leads to true happiness. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates day and night. There is no delight in the Word apart from meditation on it, which means that delighting in the Word requires engaging with it thoughtfully. Now, this is difficult and increasingly difficult in our age of 140 characters and blog posts and YouTube and podcasts. And I'm not talking about learning Greek and Hebrew here. Meditation doesn't even mean Bible study like most of us think about Bible study. The Hebrew word translated meditation here literally means to mutter. So we're not talking about study in the academic sense here. Nor are we talking about passive, peaceful, mystical, quiet, waiting, stillness, doing all that just for something to pop into my head. It's not even a verse a day to keep the devil away. It's none of that. 
This is reading God's truth and talking to ourselves about it. To mutter. It's muttering. To meditate on the word is to slow down and to read it again and again, maybe out loud until it gets in, until it penetrates. Meditation is about chewing and tasting and swallowing and digesting, processing and applying until it becomes a part of me. That's what the righteous man of the Lord, he takes it in so that it shapes him, so that, so that it shapes him, so that it molds his attitude, so that it orders his life, so that it dictates his priorities, so that it structures his thinking, so that it controls his emotions, and so that it defines his actions. So th- th- this isn't about daily devotions in the sense that you do your Bible reading plan and you get your check mark. But that said, it's impossible to meditate apart from daily Bible intake, right? The Captain Obvious statement. This is about taking in the law of the Lord in such a way that it affects us all the time, day and night. That figure of speech does not mean that the psalmist never thinks about anything else or never does anything but read his Bible. But it does mean that his mind returns to it all the time. It's his constant preoccupation. It affects his thoughts and his actions and his attitudes throughout the day and night. Charles Spurgeon, known for his great love for the Pilgrim's Progress, once said of its author, John Bunyan, prick him anywhere and the very essence of the Bible flows from him. That's the result of meditation day and night. And the simile in verse 3 really drives home this notion of meditating for the purpose of delighting in God's Word. The righteous man is like a tree planted. Right? There's stability. He's like a tree. And he's planted by our gardener God near streams of water. That's the Word. That's our nourishment. That's our vitality. And trees aren't pipes. It's not water in and then water out. It's the water of the word in and fruit comes out. There's productivity. There's growth in godliness. There's good works. There's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But even when it's not a fruitful season, because all seasons are not fruitful, Even when there's drought, when all around it's dry and barren, life is hard, life is sad, the heat is almost unbearable, there's setbacks, there's waiting, there's disappointment, there's broken relationships, there's death, there's confusion. Even then, the leaf does not wither. There's durability. You are evergreen, Christian. If your roots are deep into the water of this word so that so that truth sustains you and causes you to grow even in the difficult season, even in the fruitless season, then comes another fruitful season because that's the life cycle of the righteous man whose roots are deep down into the cool, refreshing streams of the law of the Lord. Look at the last phrase. And all he does, he prospers. So yes, the Bible does teach prosperity. I believe in prosperity, but I believe in biblical prosperity. And it has nothing to do with earthly riches and social status. That word that gets translated prospers means to fulfill the purpose for which one was created. So that same Hebrew word gets used sometimes of inanimate objects like weapons being used for the purpose for which they were made. You are a creation of the living God, made in His image, in the image of God, for the purpose of glorifying God. And when your roots are deep in the streams of the Word, 
You know how to do that in season and out of season. You know how to fulfill God's intended purpose for your life. And that's where the delight comes from. That's the blessedness. That's true happiness. Living for the very purpose for which you were made. That can't happen apart from this word. The Apostle Paul Paul wrote his own version of Psalm 1. It's Romans 12, 2. He says this, Do not be conformed to this world. That's the avoiding, the influence of evil. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's adoring the Word of God so as to be shaped by it. That, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so bear fruit. That's the righteous man. What characterizes the wicked? Well, the psalmist gives the wicked just one verse and one simile. Verse 4. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. And that's terse, that's abrupt, that's blunt. He doesn't have a lot to say about the wicked. In the Hebrew, it's not so, the wicked. So what's not so? Well, everything that's been said about the righteous. They don't fulfill the purpose for which they were created because they don't adore the Word of God and so they don't avoid evil influence and so they are not truly happy. Indeed, they cannot be. And we're not just talking about horrendous evil here. This isn't just flat-out degenerates. This isn't just the racists and the abusers. These are our nice neighbors, good parents, productive co-workers, intelligent classmates with no regard for God's Word. No rootedness in His life-giving fruit producing word and so no substance and no significance to their lives it's tragic they're self-ruled self-centered self-seeking which we all are apart from the streams of living water they are the very opposite of a fruitful tree they're like chaff right a pitchfork full of grain, tossed into the air. The heavy grain falls to the floor and the weightless husk, the chaff, is just carried away. Weightless, worthless, without substance, no lasting value. And it doesn't matter how powerful, it doesn't matter how talented, it doesn't matter how full of charisma, how much money, how much beauty, they are not fulfilling the purpose for which God created them. Like I said, it's blunt, it's stark, it's crystal clear. And if that's not bad enough, there's more. Two people, two ways, and two destinies. Not fulfilling the purpose for which we were made here and now affects our future there and then. Verses 5 and 6 again. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Today is not the only day that matters. There's this day, and there's that day. Martin Luther said, I have two days on my calendar. This day and that day. And that day is a judgment day. And those who follow the way of the wicked will not stand in God's courtroom. They will have no communion with God's eternal people. They will perish. That is an eternal death sentence. It's destruction. This psalm ends with a chill up the spine. It begins with happiness, the way of the righteous, and ends with perish, the way of the wicked. But the Lord knows. He knows the way of the righteous. That doesn't mean that he's intellectually aware of you, Christian. It means that he really knows you. That's a relational word. He's not vaguely aware 
of the righteous. He knows them intimately and continually. He cares for them. He's attentive to them. He holds them. No one slips through his fingers. He preserves the righteous with eternal life and eternal happiness. Two people, two ways of life, two eternal destinies. And the question, which one? It doesn't get more basic than that. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, okay, I get it. I see that's what the psalm says. But it unnerves me. Because I don't live up to this psalm. Not perfectly. Not consistently. I don't always resist the influence of the wicked. I'm hit and miss in my Bible intake. And even when I do read, I, I don't always delight in it. I'm not sure I can even say that I'm fulfilling God's ultimate purpose for me. I do not live up to this psalm. Well, if that's you, let me say this. Welcome to the club. Neither do I, perfectly or consistently. I mean, have you ever known anyone who does? So, what does that mean? Is this just a fiction just a pie-in-the-sky ideal that no one can reach? Well, there are a lot of things I could say in response, but I'm going to say three main things. First, let this psalm cause you to look beyond yourself to the one truly righteous man. There was only one who ever fulfilled this psalm perfectly. Only one who ever perfectly avoided wickedness while still loving the world. Only one who perfectly delighted in God's Word. Only one who perfectly fulfilled God's purpose for him. And God's purpose for that one truly righteous man, Jesus Christ, was to receive our condemnation in our place for our sin. For all the times we come under the influence of wickedness and don't delight like we should. It was God's purpose to give us His righteousness, His perfect avoidance of wicked influence counted as ours, His perfect delight in the law of the Lord counted as ours. Jesus lived this psalm on our behalf, and He died and rose again to purchase our forgiveness for every time we don't live up to this psalm. So right away, there's hope in the gospel when we look beyond ourselves to the righteous man, Jesus Christ. And we look to him and we remember that he died so that we would fulfill this psalm. It's not just pie in the sky. Listen, if you recognize that you don't delight in the law of the Lord today, there's hope for you because of Jesus. We don't have, we don't have to, become fatal, to become fatalists. In fact, we have to be careful not to become fatalists. That delighting stuff, that sounds good. But that just isn't me. I mean, I don't like to read, let alone meditate. You know what that is? It's the way of the wicked. You know why? Because it ignores God and scorns the gospel. So if, you, if you're not delighting this morning, no, you're not the only one to ever struggle here. You know who else struggled? Besides every Christian who ever lived? The psalmist struggled. Right in the midst of Psalm 119, you know Psalm 119, right? 176 verses about the Word, about delighting in the Word. And right in the midst of it, the psalmist says this, verse 36, Incline my heart to your testimonies, to your Word, and not to selfish gain. Exclamation point. The psalmist recognized a cooling in his delight in the word of God, and so he was being wooed by the world. He was starting to take counsel among the wicked, and he desired selfish gain. So what does he do? Does he just give up and say, well, I guess my heart is more inclined to money than the Bible. That's just who I am. There's nothing I can do about it. No, he does this. He pleads with God to change his heart. He's not passive about his spiritual affections, and neither should we be. Life is a war. Life is a fight for delight. 
If you're delighting in God today, thank Him for that. It is a gift of grace. Pray that He would preserve it. Pray that He would even increase it. If you sense a cooling in your delight today, ask God to blow on the embers and fan it back into flame. If your delight is gone, what do you do? You repent. You turn from that sin to God, ask Him to forgive you, and then receive His forgiveness that's yours in Christ and receive the power of the gospel for change. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that Jesus died and rose again so that your prayer for delight would be answered. Every time we celebrate the Lord's table in our church, we read a portion of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. Jesus said about his death that this is the new covenant in my blood. I'm dying to purchase the new covenant. All the new covenant promises, I'm dying to purchase them on your behalf. Promises like Deuteronomy 36 to circumcise our heart so love God with all our heart and soul. Jesus died to purchase that. He died to purchase Jeremiah 31, 33 to put His law within us and write it on our hearts. He died to purchase Ezekiel 36, 27 to cause us to walk in His statutes and be careful to obey His rules. Jesus died to purchase the fulfillment of those promises for us. He died and rose again so that our prayers for renewed delight in His Word and love for Him would be answered. That's encouraging. That fills me with hope. So, in response to this psalm, we look beyond ourselves to Jesus. We pray for delight. And, third thing we do, we don't forget what God's Word is and what it does. This is not merely a book. This is not merely theological data. It's not mere religious instruction. It's not less than that, but it's so much more. Here's what it is. This is God's revelation of Himself. This is where the invisible Creator of the universe, separate from us in His awesomeness, crosses the chasm and gives Himself to us. This is how we get God. Right? We, we don't delight in ink on a page. We delight in the God who wrote it. And it's here where we meet Him. This is where we encounter Him. This is where He comes near to us. In other words, this is where we go to fellowship with God. This book is our burning bush. This is our burning bush out of which God speaks to us directly. We meditate on the words written here because they reveal the Word. The living Word, Jesus Christ, shines forth from the written Word. Remember what Jesus said? To the Pharisees, John 5, 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about Me. You know what that means? Jesus is the stream of water that we put our roots down into when we meditate on the Word. That's what He said, John seven thirty seven. If anyone thirsts, let him come to Me and drink. He's the fountain of living water. Th- this book is not merely a source of information about Him. This book is the source of our relationship with Him. The great evangelical scholar J.I. Packer in his book on the Bible entitled God Has Spoken wrote this, and I end with this because this is what I want us to go out of here remembering. God's purpose in Revelation in this book is to make friends with us. Isn't that beautiful? And that's awesome. That's amazing. And to be friends with the God of the universe is to have eternal delight and happiness. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for its clarity.